Hey everyone, welcome back to L2 Games, and welcome to episode 11 of the L2 Games podcast. Today we're doing a bit of a special episode. I wanted to do this for episode 10 as a celebration of having done 10 episodes, but because of the scheduling, we weren't able to do it, so... Today we're doing our top 10 favorite games, and I am joined today by a new guest, the guy who used to kick my ass at video games, my big brother Adam. Adam, how you doing? Oh, not too bad. Happy to be part of this. So Adam, why don't we just start by introducing yourself, tell everyone a little bit about the kinds of games you play, that sort of thing. As you said, I'm Adam, I'm your older brother, who formerly kicked your ass at every video game and now can't win to save my life. Yeah, my uh, gaming style is more based towards the fantasy, medieval, sword and board. I do enjoy a good sci-fi game. And, you know, the classics. Good old N64, Mario Party. <laughs> Alright, so, today we're counting down our top ten favorite games of all time. Just a note to everyone listening, we're not talking best games of all time, we're talking our favorites. This is purely subjective. You're totally free to have 10 favorites of your own. That's the first thing. Second thing, we've got a couple ground rules here. So, we're gonna fire off our five honorable mentions to start. When we do our actual top 10s, we're picking either a game or a franchise. That's so that we don't take up the whole list with one game from a certain franchise, because I know I would have a big problem with that. So, that's the other thing. But we're gonna try to explain which game in that franchise is our favorite and why. Let's get started. Adam, your five honorable mentions. Fable 1, Ghost of Tsushima, Until Dawn, Goldeneye, and Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. My honorable mentions are The Elder Scrolls V, Skyrim, Halo Reach, Just Cause 2, Assassin's Creed 2, and Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Okay, Adam, you're number 10. So number 10 for me was the Batman Arkham series. Specifically, Batman Arkham City. Okay, why Arkham City? For me, there were several things. I really enjoy the classic casting of Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill. To me, they are the original Batman and Joker. That's the Batman and Joker I grew up with. I am a huge comic book nerd. I have an entire Batman tattoo. And I feel like they, the developers treated the source material with a lot of respect. There weren't any major changes. I mean, my issues with Arkham Knight, we've discussed in the past, but for the viewers here, they changed Jason Todd, who is the Red Hood in the comic book continuity, to the Arkham Knight. I mean, it's not a major change and it doesn't affect the gameplay, but... I mean, I understand why they did it though, because mm -hmm. they don't want to just be completely retreading a death in the family, but at the same time, anyone who knew any of those stories knew from the start that that's who the Arkham Knight was. So yes. I'm really super effective as far as uh, red herring. No. My number 10 is Mafia 2. Mafia is one of those series that I wouldn't have played had it not been for having free demos on the Xbox Live Marketplace. And I really wish developers these days would put more effort into releasing demos for people because there are actually quite a few games on my list that I wouldn't have touched if not for demos. Mafia 2, approaching it, it looks on its face like a GTA game set in the 40s. It's sort of a faux open world game. Like, it's a very linear story told within an open world environment, so it's kind of misleading in that sense. And it's also not a satire like GTA is. You know, GTA is kind of meant to be very tongue-in-cheek humor. Mafia is a very serious and dark story, and a very personal story with high emotional stakes about someone who grows up in poverty and turns to a life of crime, a life of organized crime. And story-wise, it, it told a great story of two best friends who get caught up in this world of crime and, you know, the things they lose and have to sacrifice along the way, and I really enjoyed the story and gameplay wise you know solid driving mechanics um, great shooter mechanics so it like it checked all the boxes for me the other big thing I loved about Mafia 2 was just it had a bunch of little details that at the time didn't seem like they were all that common in games like you do things like 
turn on your faucet in the kitchen or go to the fridge and get a sandwich and a lot of games at the time this was in 2010 didn't have that level of detail or even something like the magazine dropping out of a gun when you go to reload and i just appreciated that attention to detail in it okay all right moving on to number nine what does he got so number nine for me is star wars the old republic okay and for me i've lost endless hours in the star wars galaxy but for me star, star wars the old republic it's it's your star wars story there are eight unique classes these eight classes have an, a unique storyline each well doesn't it also depend on the faction too whether you're jedi or sith absolutely and more along that line you can play a dark jedi or a Sith with a conscience. It's literally every choice you make affects the galaxy. Yeah, it's got that classic Bioware branching narrative. Absolutely. Where you get to make choices that actually affect the outcomes for your character, but done on a, a larger scale because it's an MMO and has been going on now 10 years. Yes. It's impressive yes. too, to have a branching narrative go out that long. And it's weird to me how Bioware seems to have gotten it so right with the Old Republic, and then went and had a live service game like Anthem, which they got so wrong. Yeah, and there's another game that I was turned off of because of the reception it got. Yeah, rather than being able to try it for yourself. Although, to be fair, I went out and picked up Anthem when it was on sale for five bucks. It wasn't worth the five bucks. <laughs> I was bored of it within the first hour and a half of playing it. So, moving on from that, your number nine. My number nine is Uncharted 4 A Thief's End. That so I, I, me, I guess I'll say the whole Uncharted series, but specifically Uncharted 4 is my favorite. Um, I felt that Uncharted 4 told the best story. They ditched the supernatural elements from the first three games, which I was actually thankful for. Those always came in sort of the third act of the game and felt like just coming completely out of left field to throw off what was otherwise a grounded story. So, for, for me there, just some clarity for the viewers, Uncharted 1, you're talking about the zombies. Yeah, the zombies, and then Uncharted 2, it's the, the guys in Shambhala who drink the tree sap and then get superpowers pretty much. So, I like that Uncharted 4 told a more grounded story. It also told a much more personal story for Nate, because it was all about rediscovering his family, whether that's rediscovering his relationship with Elena, who, you know, he gets into some rough waters with because he keeps lying about where he is and what he's doing and not wanting to go back into this life of adventuring and thievery. Or yeah, his relationship for it. Yeah. Or his relationship with Sam, who he's thought for the last ten years is dead. So uh, again, I, I love that more personal aspect of it. We see a much more vulnerable Nathan Drake. It also has some of the best action set pieces in the entire series. The grappling hook car chase is my favorite one of the entire series. You know, you're getting dragged along in the mud, but still shooting at people, jumping from car to car, and it's just, a, just such a badass moment for the series. So what do you have for number eight? Number eight is Grand Theft Auto V for me. Wow, number eight. Like I said, this was a very tough list for me. Okay. I mean, for me, Grand Theft Auto started with Vice City. And at that time, I was much younger and didn't have an appreciation for the story. But for me, Grand Theft Auto V just took it to another level. Having three playable characters throughout a story that started completely separate and the way they interwove the stories to come together in the end was amazing and the, the actors were incredible and you and I have both had the pleasure of actually meeting Trevor Phillips, Stephen Ogg. Yep. And he is... That was awesome too. This one he is favorite. just as amazing in person as he is portraying Trevor. And I'm glad you say the actors behind characters because a lot of people miss the fact that it's not just voice acting they're doing, they're actually doing real acting. And one of the things I love about GTA is it's a very cinematic game. You see the cutscenes are shot 
using real cameras, and obviously it's a lot of mocap, but they're doing real scenes, and it feels like a really long, drawn-out heist movie, but it's really well done. There's a lot of great humor, a lot of strong character interactions, the relationship between Michael and Trevor. It was just, overall, one of the best stories I've played. I do like the, rela the relationship between Michael and Trevor, but my favorite relationship in the game is the mentorship between Michael and Franklin. Mm -hmm. And just how much work Rockstar put into that relationship. And even with Grand Theft Auto Online, which is amazing in its own right and a great experience for gaming. And just the continuation of Franklin's story in the latest expansions, or however you would phrase it, in Online, just show how much he learned from Michael. It's also impressive too that GTA 5 has been around as long as it has to and Rockstar have put clearly a lot of work into it and it shows. So on that note, your number 8. My number 8 is another Rockstar game, Red Dead Redemption 2. Okay. So I would put Red Dead higher on this list. A lot of people I know really love it, but my problem with it is the main story Really, like, as far as the plot goes, there isn't actually a whole lot of depth to the plot. The plot is, you know, Dutch and his gang are on the run from the Pinkertons, and they want money to escape from this country with the, this rising uh, system of law and order, and they want to escape and go somewhere where they can just live their free lives and be outlaws without lawmen breathing over their shoulder 24-7. The problem with that is that, it, you know, it's very bare bones. You know, how many times in the game does Dutch say, I have a plan, or we need more money, or Arthur's just like, we just need the money. And, you know, it's, it's very simplistic. Where the story is interesting is as far as Arthur's characterization. We see him go from this ruthless enforcer in Dutch's right hand to a dying man who has to confront his own misdeeds throughout his life. And he's confronted with the fact that it is the fact that he is so evil and ruthless that is now killing him. And he tries to atone for that throughout the rest of the game by, you know, being a mentor to John Marston or, you know, just trying to be a better human. But um, at the end of the day, what really sells me on Red Dead Redemption 2 isn't any of that. It's the level of detail that Rockstar put into the game. Whether that is world details like these rough and rugged mud roads that you, know, you leave footprints in or whatever, or the deep snow you walk through, um, NPC interactions that make it feel like a really lively world, down to things like the dirt on your gun and cleaning it off because if you let it build up, your gun starts to jam and stuff like that. It's just such a detailed game that it's hard not to be impressed with it. Yeah, I, I can agree with that. The storyline itself, good, not great, but the finer points and yes, the, the wear and tear on your outfit, the your accuracy actually decreases as your weapon gets dirty. Mm -hmm. Or even things like bullet holes in your hat. I also love just going around and interacting with the NPCs and like yelling random insults at them and seeing their reactions. That's <laughs> one of my favorite parts of the game. But yeah, just, just a really detailed, really beautiful world. It has some of the best lighting I've ever seen in a game. And when I say beautiful world, it's like, it's interesting because it's not like visually beautiful. It's not these, you know, sweeping vistas like you see in something like Ghost of Tsushima. Like, you see, like, rolling fields in this feudal Japan and, like, brightly colored flowers and stuff, whereas Red Dead is a very rough and rugged world. But I think that's really beautiful in the sense that it is... It's a very rugged realness to it. It feels like a real place. Feels not, like you're in the old west. Yeah, yeah, it's not a gamified world. It is just this world that exists. That they built onto the first Red Dead Redemption's map, too. Which is another really cool thing. I like when games 
reuse an old map, but then build on it because it feels like a natural continuation of what came before. All right, so moving on to number seven, what do you got for us? So number seven, circling back to Bioware yet again, Dragon Age Origins. The storyline, depending on your class and your race, starts off unique. I mean, the storyline's different for the dwarves, or if you're a human mage, you grew up in the circle and then... I mean... Yeah, it's again the Bioware branching narrative thing. Absolutely. My downfalls with their Dragon Age, though, is the turn-based combat system that they favored so heavily in their games. Yeah. I mean, it was acceptable to do turn-based combat in Knights of the Old Republic. I still would have preferred a real-time action RPG-type combat. But, like, that was 2002, so, you know... We'll cut them up right yeah, on that. <laughs> but, you know, Dragon Age Origins came out in, what, 2009? So at that point, you know, they've leaned on it so heavily for so long. It's time to sort of get with the modern era of gaming. If you like real-time strategy, okay, sure, turn-based is fine, but... You know, in, in this third person, really what has become an action RPG, I feel like turn-based systems have really become out of place, especially for someone like me too, because I do not have the patience or the, int the attention span to just sit there and watch my game be played. I want to actually be doing it. Yes, and that's the thing, it's, for me, a game like Dragon Age Origins is D&D &D with fancy graphics. Mm -hmm. Although, to be fair, Origins graphics weren't the best for that time. I, one big problem I had with its graphics was that all the clothing was weirdly shiny for some reason. Yes, the leather armor, the cloth armor, it all was very glossy. Yeah, which was kind of off-putting. So, number seven for you. For me, number seven is Ghost of Tsushima, which I would put higher, maybe, but because it's such a new game, I don't have the nostalgia factor kicking in, but man, this was such a good game and it was such a treat to have such a, a well-written story in an era where in the last 10 or so years, so many games have become these live service multiplayer focused games. It was really refreshing to see a strong single player story unfold and not just the story, but incredible combat. It feels a lot like the Arkham games combat in a sense that there's, you know, a very smooth flow to it, but there's also a lot of intentionality, like timing your blocks, choosing your sword form, those sorts of things that just take it to another level. You know, you have to use the water form when you want to fight an enemy with a shield or using the moon form when you want to fight a, an enemy much larger than you. So those little details really add to the combat, but the story is just so well done. You've got Jin Sakai who has grown up as this very devout samurai who follows the samurai code to a T, but when the Mongols invade and decimate the samurai, he starts to learn that maybe honor isn't the most important thing and begins to bend and break the samurai code, which tests his relationship with his uncle. Of course, his uncle eventually finds out that Jin has been going around, you know, doing sneak attacks on people, stabbing them in the back, poisoning them, and you see the last familial relationship that Jin has left start to deteriorate before his eyes, and he has to make a choice between saving his people or saving his relationship. And the ending to the story is so absolutely gut-wrenching because at in the end, the Shogun tells Jin's uncle that he has to make a choice. He has to bring Jin to him or he will die. And so you have to make a choice now whether to kill your uncle and give him an honorable death by combat or allow him to be executed by the Shogun. And it's just such such a gut-wrenching moment because Jin now has completely given himself to the ghost and needs to make this decision of whether to, again, give his uncle an honorable death, but at the same time end his uncle's life himself or allow his uncle to be killed by someone else because he can't stomach killing him. Yeah, and I mean, Ghost of Tsushima was one of my honorable mentions, and I would love for it to be on the list, but I have not yet completed the game. But 
just even as far as I've gotten, the the scenery, the attention to detail, even the armor sets, like just amazing and beautiful. That was the other big thing. That was the other big thing for me too was the world that this game takes place in. It is by far one of the most beautiful open worlds I've ever had the pleasure of playing around in. Yeah, again, these beautiful sweeping vistas of feudal Japan, whether it's these brightly colored flower fields or you know, cherry blossom trees blowing in the wind. It's just such a great game to look at with a great story and incredible combat. So hard not to include it in the top 10. And maybe as the game gets older, that nostalgia factor will kind of dig in and it'll start to become, you know, an, an even more revered game on my list. But for now, I feel like number seven is a fair spot for me. Okay, moving on to number six, what have you got? So, we've touched on this already, but Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. Yeah, not to be confused everyone with Star Wars The Old Republic, this is a different game, so for those of you who don't know, The Old Republic was the one that came out in 2012, it's the MMO. Knights of the Old Republic came out in 2002 for the original Xbox, and it's one of the best stories ever told in gaming. I don't think you could have said it any better. For me, KOTOR is a timeless Star Wars classic. Yeah, and that's that's not even just like talking Star Wars games. It is a timeless Star Wars story. It is one of the Star Wars stories. Absolutely, and I mean, just the twists in it. I mean, you start off as this Republic soldier on a ship who get attacked by the Empire and you do not understand why they're attacking and yeah. they're... Yeah, you kind of think you're just a nobody foot soldier who happens to be force sensitive. Yeah, and over time you start discovering your connection to the force and then eventually you become a Jedi. And then as you progress further in the game, there's the twist that this dark Sith Lord that the galaxy is still recovering from. Yes. The Dark Lord of the Sith at this time. Darth Revan is you. And you have been you were injured in combat and betrayed by your apprentice Darth Malak. And you lose your memory which has set you on this path of self-discovery and, and redemption, really, for Revan. It depend, I guess, depending on whether you choose with, to be with the uh, light or dark. With the Bioware narrative again here, circling back to this again, is you have the choice. Do you resume the mantle of Darth Revan and bring the galaxy to its knees once again, or are you redeemed? Are you the Jedi Revan now? Mm -hmm. The Knights of the Old Republic plot twist, too, is arguably the best plot twist in gaming. You know, you've got this Dark Lord of the Sith who has brought the galaxy to its knees with this war, and you find out, holy shit, I've been the bad guy this whole time. And it's it's just so cool to, to finally get that reveal and see how, how deeply entrenched in this galaxy this character who you thought was a nobody really is. And once you read up on all the lore behind it too, it's just really mind-blowing that this was an original story created for a video game, but has become so revered within Star Wars lore generally. Another thing about these Bioware games is the characters, again, the companions, and specifically in Knights of the Old Republic, you start off as this foot soldier nobody, and Carthonassi, you st stand side by side with this this man and fight with him. He's a Republic soldier. And then you find out that his family was killed by your character, essentially. And all the good that you've done with him is just, just the way his character like reacts and just the interaction between you just shows how much Bioware puts into their stories. Yeah, you really see, you know, again, it's that tension between Karth and Revan once you uncover the truth. Which, you know, 
it's the same voice actor who plays Karth that plays Caden Alenko in Mass Effect. And it's really interesting because you sort of see a mirroring of that tension too when, if you let Caden live, Caden confronts um, Commander Shepard when he finds out he's working with Cerberus. Yes, yes. But again, that really speaks to just the, the really great writing capabilities that the teams at Bioware have had as far as crafting these meaningful relationships. So for me, at number six, I have the Batman Arkham series. And specifically, and I might get a lot of hate for this, my favorite in the series is Batman Arkham Origins. So starting with the series as a whole, man, this showcases every aspect of Batman. You see him as this tortured hero who has come from a life of tragedy and become a symbol of hope for Gotham. Um, you see the brutal physical combat and just how physically imposing Batman is with this free flow combat system. And the animations for the combat are so well done. You, you know, it feels, it feels like you are a superhero because you know you're dodging punches left and right and countering them with just these perfect strikes and taking out rooms full of enemies by yourself with minimal effort and it's it's so fun and so free-flowing and fast-paced especially once you master it that you can't help but love the combat in these games but then you also get the detective side of Batman where you go into these crime scenes and you have to look around for different clues, whether it's DNA evidence or even the Riddler puzzles where you're looking for comic Easter eggs scattered throughout the world. You know, it's just really such a love letter to Batman as a character. The reason I pick Origins as my favorite among the series is because it tells the most personal story as far as Batman goes. and. It's really all about the relationship between Batman and the Joker and why this rivalry has persisted for as long as it has. You know, you see a young, really arrogant and angry Batman in Origins, which is such a stuck which is such a far cry from the really stoic and you know, he is still a recluse in uh, the later years in his career, but he's he's much more stoic and a, a little more upbeat, you know, he doesn't come across as really as angry and brooding as he does in Origins. Origins, you have this rageful vigilante who wants to, to stop at nothing, even if it means getting himself killed in order to stop these assassins who are wreaking havoc on Gotham. Yes, he's in, in, in Origins, Batman is a very more brash and Mm -hmm. dark character. And you see that really test the limits of his relationship with Alfred, too, because they sort of, you know, argue with each other over Batman not wanting to spend the night at home and have a nice Christmas dinner with Alfred. You know, he wants to go out there and beat the living hell out of these assassins. And then he discovers the Joker. And up until this point, sure, Batman has faced supervillains, but he's never met anyone on the level of psychotic that the Joker is. It just does a really good job of exploring the, the foundations of the relationship between Batman and the Joker. And that's what I really love about it. And sure, they don't have the original voice cast, but Troy Baker did a hell of a job with his Mark Hamill impersonation. And uh, for everyone who thinks, you know, Arkham City is the better game, okay, sure, like, Arkham Origins had its problems when it, when it released. It had a handful of bugs. There was also some continuity issues, like people were sort of upset that he had this crime scene recreation tool where he could just, you know, assemble all the evidence and create a video of what happened at the crime scene. But I don't look at it that way as a continuity error. The way I see it is sort of just, you know, games have to grow and evolve over time. And if you're going to do a prequel, sometimes that means including things that weren't included in the game before, just for the sake of progressing the gameplay and keeping the players engaged. Like, if you're just rehashing the same gameplay mechanics, then it might as well have been DLC. All right, moving into our top five now. What is your number five favorite game of all time? Number five, we were just talking about it, Uncharted 4, I think Sentinel. I'm surprised Uncharted 4 is your favorite. I would have expected Uncharted 3 from you. I do very much love 3, but I mean, you've touched on a lot of things that I 
definitely resonate with. Uh, the struggles that Nathan has as a person lying to his wife and then her finding out the truth and reconnecting with this brother that he's been missing since before we even met Nathan. Like mm -hmm. Before Nathan even met his wife because it's a big reveal to her too that he has a brother. Which he has never mentioned. Yeah. For me, the Uncharted games are a... We'll call it a modern Indiana Jones. Yeah, well, I mean, really, they take a lot of inspiration. They're kind of a love letter, again, to those classic adventure movies, especially Indiana Jones. Absolutely. And, I mean, I think my favorite, absolute favorite part of Uncharted 4 is when you're in Madagascar in the 12 Towers Act. Just the level design and the beautiful scenery... Yeah, well, it's interesting with Uncharted, too, because it's never been an open-world game, but that part of the game feels very open and like you have the freedom to explore. And really, there is a lot of exploring for what are very linear levels. You know, you have to go out of your way to find all the treasures or the optional conversations or the journal entries. And I mean, just the uh, little nods back to the previous games, like when in this chapter they find the well and Sam well, goes well 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 well, well. <laughs> Sully he stole your joke <laughs> well I love the relationship between Nate and Sam and Nate and Sully and even Sam and Sully you know they have this sort of contentious relationship between the two of them where they butt heads over what is in Nate's best interest and Sully has really taken on this sort of surrogate father role with Nate and doesn't want to see him get hurt because of Sam's bad choices, but Sam is also the last real family that Nate has left, and so it, it really tests Nate's loyalties. Absolutely, and I mean, Sam does lie to Nathan and about a lot of things, and not least of which is the fact that Rafe bought his way out of prison and helps him to find Nate in the first place. Yes. And I mean, Sam's mentality that I know what's best for my brother, I'm the older brother, mm -hmm. and the contention between him and Sully. Five for me. So this is actually a relatively recent game. In fact, I think it might be the most recent one on my list as far as me actually playing it. Apex Legends. Really? So I've only been playing Apex Legends for about a year. It came out in February 2019, but I just started playing it at the end of February, beginning of March last year. But in that time, there are few games that I have spent as much time with and enjoyed as much as I have as playing Apex Legends. I've always wanted to really enjoy Battle Royale games. I really wanted to enjoy a game like Fortnite or PUBG. When PUBG came out, it was super unpolished and it wasn't available on PlayStation. And of course, being a console gamer, that was disappointing to me. It also came with a $30 price tag, which kind of rubbed me the wrong way because Fortnite was free. But then Fortnite was, you know, this super cartoony thing when it came out and it didn't have all the collaborations with these other pop culture franchises, which is something that you know, recently has kind of sold me on Fortnite, but at the time it was just, you know, a cartoony battle royale that was really focused on building, which I thought was kind of dumb and which I still really don't like to this day. You know, I, I hate when we're playing Fortnite and kids just immediately defensively build a huge ass tower and they're afraid of a gunfight. It's just such an annoying way to play, but we're not here to rag on Fortnite. So, Again, like I wanted to get into Battle Royales. For a long time, I played uh, Call of Duty Warzone because when the pandemic started, all of my friends who weren't gamers were all of a sudden playing video games and they were playing Warzone because it was free to play. It was something that was familiar to them with Call of Duty. But then that game got so disgustingly infested with cheaters and the, the maintenance of the game was so bad and the meta was so unbalanced that I needed something else. So one of my friends, convinced me to play Apex Legends, and at first I hated it. I thought there was such a steep learning curve as far as finding attachments, um, figuring out which guns to use, the movement was hard to get used to, but, you know, I, after a while I really started to enjoy it and get invested in the lore. You know, it, I didn't know at the time that it was 
really a spiritual successor to Titanfall. It's set in the same universe as Titanfall, and um, it, it's got a lot of lore behind it, which I really wish they did a better job of exploring because you've got so many cool character designs and character backstories that don't really get fleshed out through the gameplay. But it's a fast-paced battle royale that I have been able to play with so many of my friends, and I've gotten pretty good at. Like, you know, I've got like a 2.9 KD ratio now, I've gotten up to Diamond 2 rank, and it's it's just a lot of fun. And I haven't had that much fun with a game in a very long time. So, number four. Number four. The Witcher 3 Wild Hunt. Okay. I just absolutely love The Witcher. Just the story behind Geralt of Rivia and his relationship with Ciri and Yennefer and the storyline is incredibly well written. A thing that they did very well is your hair grows over the course of the game and people notice your hair growing. I, I mean, there's a scene in Skellige where if you don't shave, or if you do, Yennefer says, well, oh, you don't shave, or you haven't shaved your beard, it looks good, or you're clean shaven, it looks, I don't remember what she says, <laughs> but just a beautiful open world, and the monsters, and like, the monster journal was a huge thing for me. Like, yeah. learning about every creature, it's a game that really makes you dive into your journal and your codex to figure out what the weaknesses of uh, different um, monsters are too and to prepare yourself best to go into battle. Like you actually have to involve yourself in the lore. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed The Witcher 3. I think if I had a big problem with it, it's that the story was a little too long. Like I don't have a lot of free time on my hands so it's not easy to just sit down and pick something up and invest myself in an 80 to 100 hour story these days so that was kind of tough for me the other thing too was like the combat wasn't the smoothest like the combat animations could feel a little wonky at times so those aspects you know i, I didn't really enjoy as much but i think my favorite thing about the witcher was the monster hunting you know being this contract monster hunter it really reminded me of the early days of supernatural which, Absolutely. Which, in the first five seasons, is one of my favorite shows ever. Before they, you know, really leaned into the whole war between heaven and hell for the last ten seasons, which you know, got old really quick for me. Not to rag on Supernatural too much here, it's not what we're here for, but the, the whole, you know, idea of going from one town to another and taking care of a monster problem really r reminded me of Supernatural, which is a huge hit in, right in the nostalgia bones, so... Absolutely. And even rolling into town and going to the bounty boards and picking up the bounty and then going to negotiate the contract itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then giving you that freedom of choice, you know? Do you want to be a good guy and take a lesser cut? Do you want to, you know, play hardball and say, okay, well, either you pay me what I want or a monster kills you all. Yeah, absolutely. And for you, number four. For me, number four is Alan Wake. Again, so, a game that I've never played. I've seen you play it, and I see the appeal of it. I've just never picked up a copy. But the thing with Alan Wake is it's just such an incredibly and criminally underrated game. And what really sold me on it was the story. When I first played it, I was a young, aspiring writer, and seeing this story about a writer who is struggling for years with writer's block, who used to be a best-selling author, that in itself resonated with me. But then you start to peel back the layers and see how complex of a character Alan is. Not only does he struggle with writer's block, but he also has a really short temper. He struggles with alcoholism and staying sober. He's got a, a tumultuous relationship with his wife, you know, he, he snaps at her a couple times, but at the end of the day, as he says, she is his muse, she is the most important thing in his life, and really, Alan Wake is, as much as it is a psychological thriller slash horror story, it's also a love story. Alan loses his wife to this dark presence when she is taken and kidnapped by it and sort of held for ransom. 
and he will stop at nothing to get her back. It's never really about, you know, beating this dark presence for Alan. His goal is not to save this town or anything. His goal is to find his wife and save her. And sure, maybe that's a selfish motivation, but it makes Alan feel like a very real character. I also just love dark games and I love the elements of horror to this. There are so many fun jump scares in this. You know, at one point I was actually, you know, kind of afraid to play this game late at night, and yet I also really wanted to because I enjoy I enjoy horror movies because they make you feel something. Even if that feeling is that the old lady sitting in the corner of your room in the middle of the night is watching you. <laughs> but you know, it, it really makes you feel something. You know, you get that sense of chills up your spine as you're walking through a dark forest because you know at any second someone could jump out from behind you with an axe. And you get these like horror stinger sound effects that just really sell that tension and build up to it. So yeah, for me, it, it's the um, best hike through a dark forest game I've ever played. All right, so top three now. What is your number three? Number three? And I think we might be on the same page with this one, Mass Effect 2. Yes, Mass Effect 2. I, I so want to awesome. say the Mass Effect series as a whole for me, because I love the whole series so much. And this was actually a tough debate for me, because I was torn between 2 and 3, but I settled on 2. Yeah, but why did you pick 2? I think, in all honesty, the Mass Effect series is the best sci-fi story ever written. It is on par, if not better, than Star Wars. And I am wow. a huge... I'm, I'm actually fanatic. surprised to hear you say that. The character designs, like Thane Krios, for example, just a completely unique design. I mean, the alien races are some of the coolest designs in video games. The Asari, the Turian, the Krogans, everything is unique. I've always had a really deep respect for that too, because it can't be easy coming up with like a physical form of an alien and actually you know bringing that to life in a game let alone giving them their whole planet backstory religion and culture just being able to design that in the first place is beyond impressive just so to see it so consistently well done in mass effect is really really something else absolutely and a huge thing with mass effect in mass effect one you choose your uh shepherd's origin if he's a soul survivor, a war hero, an earth orphan, mm -hmm. but you can import those choices into the later games. Like you can import your Mass Effect 1 playthrough into Mass Effect 2, and that affects your entire game, whether Ashley Williams survives or Caden Alenko, or if you... If you got some of your crew members killed during the suicide mission in Mass Effect 2, that carries over to 3. Absolutely. And that's, that's what I love so much about Mass Effect, is that it really is the pinnacle of continuity within games. Say what you will about the ending and about picking which color of explosion you want at the end of Mass Effect 3. You know, that... I, I understand people's frustration with that, but up until that point, to see the level of detail and just the most minor things that could carry through from one game to the next. Your interactions with Conrad Werner, for example, and whether you shot him in the foot in Mass Effect 2 or not. You know? The police have been in Al Jalani news. Yeah. Punching her out or not. I love the video in Mass Effect 3 where you go to the Citadel security surveillance station and you just watch her get absolutely rocked by a crow and <laughs> set flying across a room. Absolutely. But, yeah, it's just the level of detail as far as carrying over that story is so, so well done. And that's not even like, we haven't even talked about the story itself yet or the, the characters themselves or even the gameplay. For me, the combat system in Mass Effect 2 was the best. I would have to disagree with that. I felt like 3 was the more refined combat system. You know, the cover mechanics just felt a little sharper and being able to roll during combat and dodge more fluidly, as well as the, the melee attacks with your Omni tool. I really enjoyed See, those. I think that one is actually my biggest issue with the Mass Effect series in general, is the 
a holographic Omni Blade. I mean, they did very well in explaining it. And I mean, Star Wars explained the lightsaber and we're all okay with that. But at the same time, I, I think they would have done well with just a retractable blade in Shepard's armor. Could have done just as well as a plasma Omni Blade. Yeah, or just a bayonet on the end of a lancer. Absolutely. But, like, even going back to the story, you know, it's this really, really grand space opera. You've got this mysterious threat of the Reapers lying dormant in dark space, waiting to invade the galaxy. You've got espionage plot lines with Saren going rogue and trying to bring about the end of the galaxy by bringing the Reapers to to the Citadel. I mean, the political aspect of it, where Shepard's not just fighting against the Reapers, he's fighting against all the Citadel races mm -hmm. disbelieving him and... And their lack of faith in humanity. You know, it, there are so many different plot threads that intertwine with one another. And it just makes Mass Effect, like I said, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, sci-fi stories. It's a to put it in your words, it's a love letter to the entire sci-fi genre. Let's go into Mass Effect 2 a bit, because we both picked that as our favorite of the series. So why did you pick Mass Effect 2 over the others? I mean, for me, the character choices, the character storylines. Um, Jack Wall is an amazing composer. He did some amazing stuff with the soundtrack. Yeah, for me, Mass Effect 2 was kind of, you know, it was really different from the other two games in that it's actually kind of a heist movie. You know, you're bringing together your crew of people to go on this really difficult mission where you're plotting out, you know, how to infiltrate the collector base and save what parts of your crew got taken that you can save and destroy the collector base and rescue these humans and then you find out you know they've been working with the reapers the whole time and they're trying to build a reaper themselves and so at the end of the day it really does play into the larger plot but at the same time tells its own narrative and has some of the coolest set pieces in the series my f absolute favorite moment in mass effect is at the end of the human reaper fight when the reaper hand crashes down knocks the platform over you're standing on shepherd has to do this dive and slide down the platform to save one of your squad members before getting up and running back to the normandy all right so moving on number two the elder scrolls 5 skyrim i'm surprised to see you put that above mass effect see and this is the thing though i'm a pc player i was gonna say like as a console player, I feel like this is a different game, so PC, you've got a lot more options. Yes, and one of my biggest points for this, Skyrim, on its own, probably number three, but with the modability and all the options and choices you have, it definitely makes it for almost a completely entirely different game. Well, and that really speaks to the dedication of the community around Skyrim too, to have so many dedicated modders who are not just building, you know, visual mods, but there are story mods too. You can, you know, pick up and play a new story that someone in the community wrote. It's really, you know, fan fiction central. And that's one of the things that's really cool about it. And if anything has ever made me want to be a PC gamer, it's that. Yeah, and I mean, you're who you want to be in Skyrim. It's not, oh, I'm Nathan Drake in Uncharted, or I'm Master Chief in Halo. It's, yes, I'm the Dragonborn, but you decide who that Dragonborn is. Yeah, you can go around murdering townsfolk. You know, you're as good at any skill as you, as much as you practice it. You know, to the extent that you practice your magic, you could be an archmage, or you could just be, you know, someone casting, you know, fart balls of fire with your, with your hand, you yeah. know? It, it's, it really allows you to embrace the role of your character. It is the role-playing game. And for the longest time, Skyrim was sort of the gold standard too for open world design. You know, every map when it got released, like, oh, well, how does it compare to the size of Skyrim? And that's not even to talk about the cultural impact Skyrim has had too. You know, you look at all the memes that have come out of it, like, <sighs> I used to do to that too, and then I took an arrow to the knee. Yeah. yeah. 
All right, back to you for number two. Number two is another game that has been kind of forced down our throats for the last decade. Grand Theft Auto V. So we talked about it before. Again, great performances from the actors that told a really good story with a lot of great humor, a lot of strong relationships, and a lot of cool action set pieces. You know, one of my favorite moments in this is when you're playing as Trevor and chasing down the train that he's trying to crash and uh, get whatever it is on board and you have to jump from the side of the road on top of the train with the dirt bike or even like the bike chase out of the jewelry store heist you know gameplay wise the driving feels great the shooting mechanics are great it's just such a blast to play through but what puts GTA at number two for me is GTA Online because it has continued to receive major content updates free content updates for its entire lifespan since 2013 that have kept me involved. I was looking at my playtime the other day. I have played over 220 days worth of GTA online. Oh wow. Nearly an entire year, almost 10% of my time in the last decade has been spent playing GTA. And for me, you know, there, there are so many activities to do. One of the things that really made me love it, though, was the Rockstar Editor when they Absolutely. finally released that. Because you can make full-blown movies in this game. Like, how cool is that? How many other games can you just go in with your buddies and make a fucking movie? I bought the story mode for the PS5 release just so I could have the Rockstar Editor and keep making stuff because it's so much fun. Okay, so now for the big one. What is your number one favorite game of all time? So, I struggled with number one, but ultimately I knew what it was. And for me, that is World of Warcraft. That's understandable too. Like I had a lot of fun when I played World of Warcraft, but why is it your favorite of all time? I mean. At this point, the character creation is unparalleled in gaming. There are now, as of the latest expansions, 23 different races, 12 classes to play from, and the soundtracks in World of Warcraft are beautiful. The landscapes are beautiful. There's always something to do, and I have tons of friends that still play. I mean, well, and how many friends have you made through playing World of Warcraft? Absolutely. Like, like guild members and stuff. That Absolutely. You do like lifelong friends. And I mean, shout out to my two uh, current partners in crime, Rob and Alan. Rob hails from uh, Down Under in New Zealand. And Alan and I have been friends going on 13, 14 years. Yeah. And, uh, and like, you know socially world of warcraft is a huge thing you know you can really interact with people i don't think i've seen a game that's as social as wow because people are constantly in the chat talking to each other even doing things like trading items and chanting selling your services auction houses it is one of the most social games ever and like you know you get your guilds you have your, your role play servers yeah and i mean that's that's the thing too is there's something for everyone whether you're a role player and want to just hang out in the inn and sip your mead and chat with your cohorts or if you're a paladin traveling around dispelling the undead i was very close to including world of warcraft on my list i didn't because for so long it's stuck to the pay-to-play model of a subscription service, a monthly subscription. And I feel like that's just so old and outdated at this point that something needs to change. You know, I, I feel like you, that just isn't viable for people today. I think World of Warcraft, even today, could still be really successful if it was entirely free to play and then money was just spent on uh, special cosmetics. So for you, the big numero uno. Number one for me. I have to pick a franchise for this one because otherwise my whole top ten list would have just been all of these games. 
fun. Number one is The Legend of Zelda. But specifically, my favorite game in the series is Majora's Mask. The Legend of Zelda as a whole was my childhood. The very first video game I ever personally owned was Ocarina of Time. Our parents bought it for me as a Christmas present when I was three years old in 1998. Don't know why, I had no idea how to play it, but it's been such a consistently well-made series. Even Ocarina of Time, you go back and play it today, it feels like it plays like a modern game. It doesn't look the part necessarily, of course there were hardware limitations, but it plays beautifully. In my opinion, the soundtracks in The Legend of Zelda are the greatest soundtracks in video gaming history. And, I mean, that's partially because it was out of necessity. You have any game where there's no voice acting, and you've got to have something stand in for that. And they did an incredible job with that. Koji Kondo's soundtracks are so, so iconic. Whether it's the Ocarina of Time title screen music, um, the Gerudo Desert theme is a huge one. Dragon Roost Island in Wind Waker. They're just such iconic soundtracks that you can't help but love them. No, and I mean, for us, you and me specifically, for your birthday a couple years ago, we went and saw the Legend of Zelda Symphony of the Goddesses. Yeah, which was fantastic. And like, you can have a whole concert around video game music from this series. I, I don't know any other series that people would pay, you know, a couple hundred bucks to go see an orchestra play that music from. It's such a cultural phenomenon. And, like, even things like the combat is so well done and has been so influential in games. Like, the 3D lock-on melee combat, but it's still very engaging and very fun combat. You have all of the different iconic items, the, the hook shot, the bow, the, um, the mirror shield, that themselves have become icons in gaming. The Master Sword. But, to go into Majora's Mask specifically, Majora's Mask is what made me love dark stories. There were times as a kid, you know, this came out in 2000 when I was five years old, but there were times where I would just let the clock run out on the three-day cycle so that I could watch the moon come crashing into Termina and kill Link. I don't know why, but it was really dark and really fucked up. But even as an adult, you go back and play it and you realize the narrative in Majora's Mask is all about loss and grief and learning to grapple with your own mortality and either accept the inevitability of death or to try and escape it. It's just so much fun. And they take so many of the mechanics from Ocarina of Time, the time travel, the combat, whatever, and they expand upon it and, like, you look at the, the time travel aspect, they, they double down on that with the three-day, you know, Groundhog Day cycle where you have to keep looping back through. Soundtrack's incredible. Just a game that, for me, has not aged a day since it released. So, that is my number one favorite of all time. That's a pretty good choice. All right, well, that's going to do it for us here today. Thank you guys for listening to this episode of the L2 Games Podcast. And Adam, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me. We'll see you guys in the next one. I'm Commander Shepard, and this is my favorite podcast on the internet. <laughs>